Welcome you all to the uh, Sunday night worship service here at Bethel Bible Church. We have several folks here with us in person. We're glad you're here. And then those that are watching on YouTube, we welcome you as well. Um, you have any idea how many folks we have on there, Terry? Very good. Good to see you folks. And, uh, and if you're on there listening and we're not sure... We can't always see who it is on the YouTube, on Zoom we can, but if you just write or chat in, say hi to Terry and maybe tell us who you are, where you're from, just so we can have a record, but we're glad you're here. We uh, welcome you to the Sunday night service. We had a good service this morning. We finished Romans, and like I said, I uh, have to look back at my notes to see how long it was when we started. But we finished uh, all the chapters, uh, the closing uh, benediction by Paul, encouraging them to be established in the faith by the gospel of Christ and the preaching of his word. Of course, that's what we want to do. And we're, now we have the next couple of weeks. We have uh, Palm Sunday is next week. Week after that, we celebrate Resurrection Day. And um, again, with the covid we used to, uh, years back, have a sunrise service out in the back here, and we used to have a breakfast. Remember, Brother John would make the famous banana pancakes, <laughs> and of course, we miss all these things, right? Soon, I'm hoping, uh, as things seem to be getting better, with uh, it's just the nature of things like a, like a pandemic or like the virus that it goes through the population, imagine, of the whole world ups and downs, peaks and valleys, and then uh, it seems like, of course, you have what they call herd immunity, natural immunity of people that already have it. They already have antibodies. Uh, you know, my son and his church in New Jersey, like 90% of the church there had the virus. I said, wow. <laughs> so our church, as far as we know, it's like 0%. I don't think anybody from our church, uh, members or friends that are regular visitors, had the virus. So it's a lot different, and I, we've been very cautious. Uh, I know that they had several meetings where they weren't wearing masks or anything like that, and I know we've been trying to be cautious as best as we can. Do we like doing these things? No, but, but we wanted to take precautions, and we've done that right from last March. Uh, the first thing we did was we didn't meet at all, remember? No, no in-person meetings. Terry and I would come, Scotty, we'd meet here. And we would do the uh, YouTube service live at 10. We had no Sunday school was gone. Children's ministries gone. What a shame. But we, we met on YouTube. And then we would do the 6 o'clock night service at 11. Remember? And so I'd do back to back. And then, but Scotty wouldn't put it on uh, until 6 that night. So the one at night wasn't live, but it was sort of a recording. And we did that Wednesday night. We went on Zoom. We'd come here and set up a a background. I think Terry even had a green sheet that we put up and behind us. And then in May, they says, well, you could, you're able to meet on a limited basis. So some churches still have not had any in-person meetings yet. There's a lot of churches that have just done online. And uh, wow, it's a long time. And so a year has gone by. Here we are, March 21st, 15 days to flatten the curve. <laughs> I don't think the curve is flattened yet, according to them. It'll never be flattened, but just using your own common sense and what you're seeing, uh, I think there were how many cases in Hawaii today? In Oahu, 40-something maybe? I know overall the islands were like 100, but I think Oahu was... Yeah, but so it's apparently or seemingly uh, getting better, and they are talking about this. I think just to keep us under their thumb, they want to talk about a variation of the virus that... Uh, that's making sort of a comeback. I don't, I don't see anything about it. There's no, no one I know. But we're still being cautious and hope that someday soon. Uh, I know my son says, you know, I had the virus. My body has a natural immunity. Now, why do I have to wear a mask? I'm not, I don't have the virus. If people feel like they're afraid and they want to wear it, fine. But in a free country, they should not be forced to do anything. And uh, hopefully it won't come to a point uh, if there's people trying to send out scary things about you have to have a virus. Uh, if you have it or don't have it, you have to have a vaccine. If you don't have the vaccine, you won't be able to travel. There were people that have moved from Hawaii because they were afraid they would never be able to get off the island. That if they made that one of the, uh, 
a definite, you know, you have to have it. There's a way that they're making these viruses when they inject them into your system that they have these tiny, minute, microscopic nanoparticles and they could take an application on your iPhone and just scan you and these things will fluoresce in your, in your body. These particles that are in your system that they inject into you. And they can tell if you've had it and what date and everything. And so you could say you had the vaccine, but they test you and say, no, you haven't. You're lying. <laughs> you can't leave Hawaii. Now, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Uh, I hope it doesn't. And I don't think most people will stand for that. I mean, we, we, we've been doing a lot of things. I tell the people in the church, you know that every week. I appreciate people coming, being faithful, doing the things we're asking of them. And uh, what else can we do? We're doing the best we can. Things are starting to open up. We talked about it, Brother Hal. On Thursday night, we had our regular meeting with the council and the elders that we'd like to see, hopefully, maybe when school starts. That's going to be a key in August. If they're going back and the schools are opening up and the kids are going back to school, then, then maybe we can start doing things again with Sunday school classes for young people, teens, youth ministries, uh, hopefully. When I went to see Yashiko in the hospital this week, I couldn't believe that it was a year since I have actually saw her face to face. Now, they were watching and... He, then they, they were on this morning, uh, John, Robbie, and the kids, Matthias, I think, was on. So I'm glad for that. Uh, that's the way right now for some of us. We're keeping, keeping the contact going. And then you folks that have coming in person, and God's protected us, I believe. But we're glad you're here, and we're glad you folks are watching on uh, YouTube. We're looking Psalm 35. We're going to finish this tonight, and the next couple of Sundays, uh, Palm Sunday, Resurrection Day, we'll be bringing messages about, of course, the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And then Easter uh, Sunday, two weeks, it'll be, I think, April 4th. We'll just have a morning service, and we'll give you a chance if you want to be with family and whatever you're going to be doing on Easter to have that night off. Psalm 35 is what to do when friends become wicked enemies. And we looked in the life, of course, of, of David and what he went through. And most of this, Psalm 35, had to do with Saul, King Saul, who David, again, was chosen by God to replace, was very jealous of the young shepherd boy after David had killed Goliath, remember? The ladies were singing in the streets, and they were singing what? Saul had slain his thousands, but what about David? His tens of thousands, and oh, Saul. He said, what's next but him to take over and be the king? Of course, God anointed David as the king and the next king, and Saul was still on the throne. Uh, and it was furious and jealous to the point of him wanting to kill and hunting down David. Now, here's the thing that happened. David, who served Saul for a while, remember Jonathan, King Saul's son, him and David were, were like brothers. They loved one another, and they were close. And it was a very tough situation. Saul throwing javelins, trying to kill David, and... Uh, David having to flee. And they have people, David's friends, ones that he were serving in Saul's army alongside of him now were his, his enemies. And they were saying things about David to get the people against him too that were not true. And so in this psalm, David, uh, it's called an imprecatory. Imprecatory psalm was when David cried out to God to destroy his enemies. And again, David didn't go out and kill his enemies. That would have been wrong. But he just prayed for God to intervene. And there's times when, it's, again, it's not, it's not wicked. I don't know if I pray for God to kill somebody. I wouldn't do that. I would just say, God, uh, you said vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And you could say like David did. I haven't done anything wrong. David said that. And, and I want you to take care of my enemies. What they want to do to me, David said, several areas here, you'll see. Let that happen to them. Uh, and what we did last week was we looked at uh, verses 1 through 10. And tonight we're going to finish, believe it or not, we're going to finish on time too. Verses 11 through 28. And rather than read it and take too much time, we're going to read as we go. We said initially to number 1 in verses 1 through 3, pray for God to protect you. Of course, that's a natural thing. Like, please, Lord, protect me. Don't let my enemies have an advantage over me. Look at verse 1, just to look a little bit back. He says, plead my cause, as you would for an attorney, someone that is on your side. Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that what? Strive, fight, battle 
against me. Fight against them. He's asking God to fight against them that are fighting against him. And so, again, pray for God to protect you, to save time. Again, we're not going to go through something we've already done. Point two was you could ask God to execute justice. This is the imprecatory nation uh, of, of, of the psalm. David, again, had the facts. He was not guilty. Was David guilty of sin? Yes, with Bathsheba. We know that. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about what they were trying to do to him, to kill him and to hurt him and to slander him and to lie about him. And so he prayed and asked God to be on his side, and his side, of course, was, was righteous. He hadn't done anything wrong. And then third, we said, make a promise to God, what? That you'll praise him. And that's verses 9 and 10. Uh, so tonight, the new point that we haven't done yet is point number four. Tell God of the unjust hatred that your enemies have for you. All right, feeling the pain of his friends. And again, these were once very good friends and allies of David as he worked and worked under King Saul. Now they're his enemies. David poured out his heart to God. The men who sought his life were the same men who he served with as a captain in Saul's army. And like a witness in the courtroom, listen, David proclaimed his innocence. He was toward these men. And he was talking here about the good that he did for them. He said, I did good things for them, and now they're coming out against me. Did you ever have that happen to you? The people maybe that you maybe were close, closest with, that you did the most for, or maybe helped in some situations now, they're your enemy. And you don't know how it happened. How did this happen? David proclaimed his innocence, testifying, as we'll see here, the good he had done, and the evil charges they were making about him were completely unjustified and false. You know, whether you like him or not, <laughs> President Trump, since he, before he even was in office, before he was elected in 2016, you know it. They say when he was coming down the stairs, remember, of Trump Tower announcing his running for president. And, and they have proof of it in the news media. They're out to get him. All right? And I don't know of any president... Democrat, Republican, Independent, that put up with the kind of attacks that he had to put up with for four years and is still putting up with because of the hatred they have. And David, again, uh, felt this way. He hadn't done anything wrong. Why is this happening? So what do you do? Well, under number four, there's a couple of points. First, they lied and they falsely accused David. And they'll do that, believe it or not, to you. The training we went to in Dallas, Texas, being able to work with our legislators and leaders and government, uh, the man, Ralph, said, Ralph Drollinger, says, you're going to have, you know, we're dealing with politicians now. It's like a whole <laughs> different world of people. And uh, they're not going to like what you have to say about certain things. You're preaching the gospel. You're preaching the Bible, God's word. We're not judging. If any judgment is done, it's by the Lord, not by us. We're just telling them the facts. And... Uh, uh, you have to be very careful what you say. Of course, you don't hold back. We, everything we do, we tell, we teach the truth of God's word in love. There's a right way to do things, and there's a wrong way to do things, and there's a right way to, to preach the Bible without think, people thinking you hate them. We don't hate anyone. God is a God of love. Yes, he is, but he's a holy God. He's a just God. He's a righteous God. And uh, as it says in Hebrews 9.27, that's appointed unto man once to die, after that the judgment. And I always say, look, I want to face God as a heavenly father, welcome me into heaven rather than a judge. I don't want to face God uh, as a sinner, all right, being judged, because you know what's going to happen there. And so first thing, look at verse 11 now, Psalm 35, verse 11. They lie and falsely accuse you. It says, false witnesses did rise up, David said. They laid to my charge things that I knew not. <laughs> David's adversaries slandered him. They made all kinds of false accusations, and he, who does he go to? He goes to the Lord. He's pleading his case before the Lord as a righteous judge, saying, I, you know I haven't done anything wrong, but these false witnesses, they're rising up, they're charging me with things that I knew not. And so he's making his case for his innocence before his accusers. He knew nothing even about the crimes that they accused him of. He had no knowledge of it, foreknowledge of it, because it wasn't true. It was completely fabricated and made up. You ever think, what, what do you do?
When somebody accuses you of something that's totally false, well, you go to the Lord like he did. All right, go to the Lord. I, I had an incident when I coached football. Remember, I broke up a fight between two kids that were like killing each other in practice. And I'm the coach. I'm the adult. Am I going to just stand there and say, go ahead. We'll see who, uh, who's dead when it's all over, and then we'll call the police or whatever. No, I can't do that. I'm, I'm the adult. We broke up the fight, pulled the two guys apart. Next thing you know, they said, uh, Coach Cuzo, he, he ripped apart these two guys and body slammed one of them into the ground. <laughs> so I didn't do that. I had all my coaches with me. Go, go ask them. Don't take what I have to say. And, uh, of course, I prayed. I was a Christian, and I didn't want to have a bad testimony of somebody accusing me of something that was not true. So all I did was pray. They had a police officer go to all the coaches during the week, imagine, because uh, one of the kids' parents were, were saying, we're going to press charge with these coaches, you know. I said, here's what happened, officer. They were t killing each other. One guy had his knees on the guy's chest. He was on the ground helpless, and he's just punching his face without any defense. You know, when you're boxing in a ring and you're, you cannot defend yourself, they stop the fight, right? Uh, you, you're out. You've lost. Well, in this case... We separated the kids, and they made a big thing about it. Anyway, the, the cops said, look, I'm just here because they asked us to check it out. We have to do it. I believe you. Never heard from him again. That was the end of the case. We went on with the season. Nothing ever came of it. And usually that's what will happen when there's no truth to what they accuse you of. David here goes right to God and, and saw false witnesses right up. Second, they repay you evil. And here's the problem with what, what used to be maybe friends of yours, close confidants, people you knew, people you work with, people you went to church with maybe, they're going to repay you evil for the good you did for them. That's a terrible thing. They grieve your soul to the point of despair. Look at verse 12, Psalm 35, 12. He says, not only are they false witnesses, they laid to my charge things I knew not, they rewarded me evil for good <laughs> to the spoiling of my soul. As David would explain in the next point, he'd done nothing but good for these men. He, he came to their aid when they needed him in their time of need. But now they responded to his kindness with the worst kind of evils. They sought. They wanted to kill him. It wasn't just only saying bad things. Ultimately, they wanted him dead. All right? King Saul wanted him dead. They, this was a, a vicious betrayal that wounded David's soul. What he says here, the spoiling of my soul is an Old Testament word for the most excruciating grief imaginable. The bereaving as if a loss of one's child. That kind of grief is what David felt about these people that were once, again, his allies working alongside. And the good he repaid, he said, they repaid evil for good. Third, they ignore the good that you did in the past. We're on verse 13 and 14 now, Psalm 35, verse 13 and 14. But as for me, he said, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. He went to God in prayer just like we do for people. We pray for them. And in the Old Testament, of course, remember, with sackcloth and ashes. He said, I humbled my soul with fasting for these people that are trying to kill him. He said, and my prayer returned into my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily, he said, as one that mourns for his mother. You know, at some point, David uh, had tended to the needs of his friends when they were afflicted. Sick may refer to an injury or an illness. He said, when they were sick, he said, my clothing was sackcloth. The fact that they fought together with these people, him and David and Saul's army, suggests maybe there was an occasion where they were wounded in battle, and he tended to them, and he, he testified that he prayed earnestly with sackcloth and ashes and fasting. Sackcloth is a symbol of, of humility before God, of urgency and severe grief. This is what David said he did to these people that want to kill him. He said, but my prayer returned into my own bosom, he says. You know what that means? That his prayers were not being heard and friends were not being healed. Warren Wearsby, you know, a great Bible teacher, said this. David received the blessing because he prayed, but God couldn't send the blessing and answer his prayer to such evil people. Secondly, David testified his prayers were earnest and heartfelt, coming from the deepest part of his soul, the word here used, bosom. He said that his prayer returned right back, coming from his own heart, went right back to his bosom. David cared for these men with prayers when they went unanswered and his friends continued to suffer. You know what? David 
could not rejoice in that because these were men he really loved. David mourned for them as if they were members of his own family. Like it says here, I bow down heavily as one that mourneth for his own mothers. And so he's again going before God, making his case to the ultimate judge of all the universe. Fourth, they now prove to be not true friends, but rather unreliable friends. Look at verse 15 and 16. Psalm 35, 15, he says, but in my adversity, when he was going through it now, he did all he could whenever he could to help them. Now in his adversity, they rejoiced. They're rejoicing at his suffering. And they gathered themselves together. He says, yea, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. All was done behind his back. They did tear me and cease not. With hypocritical mockers, he said, in feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. David stumbled when he went into his adversity. These ungrateful friends didn't return the favor, the care that he showed to them. Instead, they turned against him, and they, they were rejoicing in the troubles that he was going through. The adversity to which David referred here, and mine adversity, they rejoiced. You know, his adversity was Saul's change of heart toward him. Saul, when he slayed Goliath, loved him. But his jealousy turned to murderous hatred. And the fellow warriors, fellow co-warriors conspired behind his back, tearing him apart with their slander. And they, they amused themselves, it says here. He said, they gathered themselves against me. They ceased not. They hypocritical mockers in feasts. In other words, they'd be uh, sitting around and making fun of David, maybe over a meal. He may have been the... Uh, the actual uh, subject of their scorn, laughing with humor, gnashing their teeth refers to when people grind their teeth together in rage or extreme pain. He says, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. You know, we should always expect people, sinners, to act like sinners. They always used to say, you can take a pig and wash the pig up and give him soap, scrub him down, with brush, comb the hair put a, a nice bow on the pig and his tail maybe, and a little, tss, 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 little perfume, and you send the pig out, what's he going to do? Man, he's going to go right back to the mud because he's a pig. And people act like people. Sinners fall in nature. And so Scripture warns about doing what? Putting confidence in men, especially unsaved. Only the Lord is trustworthy. You could trust the Lord, no question. And we're warned, like David, we can expect to be painfully wounded sometimes by disloyal friends. While we shouldn't allow ourselves to be overly suspicious, at the same time, we cannot be overly trusting of others. Again, especially the unsaved. It's all we have to guard against exposing ourselves too much against people we don't know well enough. I know Terry always uh, makes fun of me when I go uh, somewhere and I meet a stranger and we'll start talking, you know, and I... She says, you told him your whole life story in about five minutes. I, ho I'm I hope you didn't give him my Social Security number. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> That's one of my, my, my faults, maybe. Job, you remember Job and his friends? Job, likewise, his closest friends forsook him in his time of need, adding to his pain. They didn't help him. They made it worse. Sometimes the first people to turn against us are those whom we've helped the most. And that, that's just a sad fact of life at times. And if that's happened to you, we're sorry for that. I don't know what else to tell you, but to warn you to be careful in the future of who you make acquaintance with. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 2 about Christ, verse 24 and 25. John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. Jesus did not commit himself unto them, it said there, because he knew, he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew he knew it was in man. <laughs> Jeremiah, I think it says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked, right? Deceitful above all things. Who can know it? God knows the heart. And he knew we needed a new heart, and we need salvation for that reason. And so David here shouldn't be shocked, but yet he is shocked because these were people that he trusted with his life, and they trusted him. And now, because of King Saul and the lies and the slanders, they're all coming together against him. And what does he do? He does the right thing. He goes to God. He goes to the Lord. All right, point number five, moving right along. Cry out to God 
to rescue you from this and to vindicate you. Uh, he, he wants uh, the truth to come out about what's been happening to him, that he hasn't done anything wrong. David was frustrated as he discussed, again, these unfaithful friends to God. And so he burst out, we're going to see in a moment here, with a cry for God to do something. Get to a point, again, I, I, I don't believe we should wait to that point. I think we should go right to the Lord, the first sign of any trouble, amen? But uncertain that he could not bear it any longer, David asked God, you know what he did? He started to question God. <laughs> How much longer are you going to wait till you do something? <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to do that. Well, you'll see. Uh, if God lingers, a lot of times God's not, uh, God doesn't have to answer our prayer. You know, Lord, I want this and I need it now, tonight. You know, God doesn't have a timetable that's like our timetable. He'll answer his prayer when he feels it's best. But cry out to God nonetheless. You'll see what I mean. First, there are seven reasons why we should cry out for God to act. They're going to take us through the next few verses here. The longer that Saul and his men continued their attack on David, they were destroying his, his very soul, his heart, and he felt he could not survive much longer. And his reputation already gone because of their lies. It wasn't true, but still, his reputation was marred. He felt like he was dying inside more and more each day. And so he cries out to God. We're going to look at seven reasons why he cried out to God to act as, as quickly as possible. Reason one, God's inaction, and that's why he cried out, gave the impression that God didn't care that what was happening to him. Of course he did, but he felt that way because it wasn't happening immediately. Look at verse 17, Psalm 35, 17. Here he goes crying out, Lord, how long wilt thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destruction, my darling from the lions. <laughs> as, as the Lord was, as he thought, just looking on, like, like someone looking at some, a fight going on without you know, intervening. No. Saul's persecution was worsening on David. David reasoned again. How long is God going to allow this injustice? Again, because he could say it because he didn't do anything wrong. He didn't address God here as Lord, all right? He says, Lord, small letters. You know, Lord, all capitals, is Jehovah God. But Lord, L, small O, small R, small D is Adonai. It means master. So he didn't appeal to God as he usually did on his covenant, Jehovah God, all capitals, L-O-R-D. But the fact that he was God's servant and he, Lord Adonai, was, he was the master. And so the Lord, as the master, and David faithfully served him, he felt like, God, you're obligated to take care of this. Of course, he eventually did. But he felt like because it wasn't quick enough. How long will thou look on? I don't necessarily think that's a good prayer. <laughs> I, I mean, I know why he did, because he felt like, how much can I take? If you ever get to that point, I'm, I'm sure you have. Reason two, cry out to God, because the attacks of Saul's men against David were very fierce. How? Look at verse 17. He says, how long will thou look on? Rescue my soul from their destructions, my darling, from the what? The lions. He compared his attack from these men, Saul and his men, as a lion would attack a, a helpless animal. David compared Saul's army to a pack of hungry lions on a prowl, tracking their next meal. And so David cried out for God to stop them before they devoured him, the darling, more translated, precious or dear one. That's how God looks at us. We're his precious ones, amen? His beloved. Reason three, David's rescue from Saul would result in God's glory being celebrated before Israel. And this is, again, another reason for him to cry out, because, Lord, when you do deliver me, we're going to praise you. We're going to make it known before the whole nation of Israel what happened. Look at verse 18. He said, I'll give thee thanks in the great congregation. I will praise thee among much people. You know, David had already promised in verse 9 to rejoice in the Lord's salvation, to personally rejoice, to say, Lord, thank you for delivering me personally. Now he's vowing to publicly give thanks before the entire nation of God's deliverance. He wants God to know that this is what I'm going to do when you deliver me. And so, how long? 
When Saul was ultimately defeated and David was established as the king, and he was, this happened, we know that because of history, David promised to lead the nation of the nation of Israel to praise God's righteousness in vindicating him. Did it happen? Yes. But it hadn't happened yet here. He was praying for that. Reason four, David was innocent of all the charges that had been flung at him. Look, if you're, not, if you're guilty of something, don't, don't go asking God to fight for you, saying, I haven't done anything, because God's going to have to discipline you then before he disciplines who you're asking him to, because you need it more than they do. But this was not the case here, all right? For too long, he was the laughing stock of those who hated him, again, without cause. Look at verse 19. Let not them that at mine enemies wrongfully rejoice. They were wrongfully rejoicing. Neither let them wink with the eye that hate me, with again, without a cause. So he says wrongfully, without a cause, and he could say that because it was true. He couldn't bear the thought of his enemies gloating over him if they should be killed by Saul and his men. By delivering and vindicating him in the eyes of the people, then God would silence his enemies once for all. This is what I'm praying for. That's what he was praying for. And we pray for the same thing when wrongfully accused. Reason five, there's seven here. Saul's supporters were causing division. God hates division, amen, especially in the New Testament church. That's why 1 Corinthians was written, in the, and especially the first part of it. Causing division throughout the nation of Israel. That's verses 20 and 21. Look at it quick. For they speak not peace. Who? These enemies. They devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. Yea, they open their mouth wide against me. And they've said, this is what they're saying. Aha, aha, our eye had seen it. They were making up stories like, I was there. I saw it. Of course, it was all lies. After slaying the giant Goliath, David became a hero. We know that. Led to Saul's jealousy. Saul's men went place to place in an attempt to gain support for Saul. And so what they did was they saw now Saul is going after David, and these men claimed to be eyewitnesses of crimes committed by David that were not true. They said, yeah, we saw it. Aha! Uh -huh. As they filled the streets and the countryside with these untrue accusations, they provoked quiet, peaceful, law-abiding law -abiding citizens. They disrupted the peace of the land, and they persecuted those, those who came out and supported David. <laughs> uh, that was their cancel culture back in the Old Testament. You supported David? No more email, no more Instagram. Well, they didn't have it those days, but you get the idea. Reason six, two more. The Lord's silence made David feel, you know what David felt like? God's far from me. But he's not, and he's not for us either. Look at verse 22, Psalm 35, 22. This thou hast seen, O Lord. Now again, going to him as God, Jehovah, Lord, all capitals. Keep not silence, O Lord, Adonai. Be not, be not far from me. He felt like God was way off because of what he was going through. And he wanted God to act yesterday. Stating that the Lord had seen every act. You've seen it, he says in verse 22. David begged God to break his silence, to act. Keep not silence and be close to me. You know, God's only a prayer away. In fact, when we turn away from the Lord, he's right there. All we need to do is turn back to him. He never leaves us. We leave him. Now, David didn't do anything wrong here, and God was with him, but he felt like what he was going through. Lord, you see what happened. You know what happened. Please don't be silent any longer come, be not far from me. And then reason seven, David needed God to arise. That's what he says to God and defend him. Verse 23, he says to God, stir up thyself, awake to my judgment, even unto my cause, my God and my Lord. He was in deep despair here and he called upon God to awaken, not that God was sleeping, but to awaken to the injustice of his persecutors and to rouse to action the Lord was David's God, there's the all capitals there, and his master, Adonai. David needed him to fight for him against his foes. What are you going to do when things happen to you? You may not ever go through, hopefully not, something like David went through here, but we go through a lot of things in our life. If you're saved long enough, you're going to go through, and you know what I'm talking about, being falsely accused, people that you thought were your friends turning against you. First, we saw seven reasons to cry out for God. We can do the same thing. Second, 
we cry out to God to vindicate you. And, and here's what happens. God does it not because we deserve it, because of his righteousness, his perfect judgment. This is verse 24, 25, and 26. See, we're moving right along here. He says in verse 24, judge me, O Lord, my God, according to thy righteousness. You know, that's something you may not want. <laughs> judge me and see if there's any wicked way in me. Well, God's going to show you why, because he's perfect and we're not. But David felt, again, in this situation, I haven't done anything wrong. So look, judge me according to thy righteousness. Let them not rejoice over what's happening to me. Let them not say in their hearts, ah, so we would have it. Let them not say we've swallowed him up. What does he say? Let them be ashamed and let them be brought to confusion that rejoice in mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Again here, crying out to God for the truth to come out about his situation. And David appeals to God's righteousness here, his character, who he is, sinlessly perfect. And absolutely, again, certain that David, he had not done anything wrong to provoke Saul to wrath. He insisted, judge, judge me. Look at me and you'll see he wants God to evaluate all the evidence that was presented and declare him innocent. David wanted God in his perfect, sinless righteousness, and he alone could do that, declare him innocent by doing what? Stopping this from continuing. Stopping Saul and his men. From David's perspective, it would be unrighteous if the enemy prevailed, and it would have been. Therefore, God in his righteous perfection according to David here, needs to intervene. David was, was deeply hurt at, that his, pros, his persecutors were gloating. It was bothering him as it would bother us, to knowing that I haven't done anything, and they're gloating as if they're, they're, nothing's happening. I need your help to stop them. Some of his fellow soldiers, again, brothers in, in the war, were jealous of David. Remember his quick rise to power? David went from shepherd boy... <laughs> right into the throne room of Saul. From David's perspective, again, it would be unrighteous for his enemies to prevail. They were rejoicing in his hurt. David longed for the Lord to prevent them from victory and celebrate his defeat. He prayed for justice. He said they would be clothed with shame. Let them be ashamed, he said. Let them be clothed with shame. He said it twice. Let them not say we have swallowed him up. You know, when our frustrations peak and we have burdens to bear that we can't handle any longer, we get to that point, that breaking point. We must cry out like David did, cast your care upon the Lord. Why? Because he cares for you. Through the blood of Christ, we have access to his throne. David spoke boldly to God here, and the Lord invites us to approach him boldly to the throne of grace we can come boldly why he's our heavenly father and if we hadn't done anything wrong he wants to help us he wants us to come to him one of the greatest lessons here of the psalms especially 35 here is we have the liberty we do to empty our hearts to god to cry out to him while we should always again we approach god humbly in awe and fear and reverentially we can approach him as david did here honest and frankly all right at the right hand of the father who sit in the, seated there jesus himself who understands what we're going through and he intercedes for us and moreover the holy spirit of god lives in our body temple and when we don't know how to pray as we should the holy spirit promises what to intercede for us according to the will of god we never have to worry about that god loves us more than we can understand and as our heavenly father he can bear our burdens better than we can much better than we can he longs for us to turn to him and to trust him with our needs point number six is our last point we're doing good we got 17 minutes yet <laughs> celebrate god's deliverance now listen it hadn't happened yet <laughs> it's just in advance well, sometimes when I pray, I say, thank you, Lord, in advance for what you're going to do. You know, it's God's not willing that any should perish. Is it wrong that we pray, Lord? We know some people, not everyone, but some will be saved. We're going to reach out. It's sort of, I hate to use the word a numbers game, but you, you witness to so many people, some are going to trust Christ. We don't know who it is. We're just commanded to go and witness and 
preach the word, preach the gospel. And we could pray, Lord, I'm going to thank you in advance for souls are going to be saved, added to the church, and we could disciple them and train them to go out and do the same thing. So celebrate God's deliverance. This is the last point. After pleading his case to God, David's heart can rest now. And what? In his faithfulness, knowing he is going to do something. At the time may not be your time, but in God's time, he's going to take care of it. And so what did he do? He emptied his soul, David did, at God's throne. And what happened? The peace of God that passes all understanding swept over his spirit, over David's. Confident, again, in God's faithfulness, David celebrated in advance the victory God would give. Two points. First, pray for God's people. Pray for God's people. Look at verse 27, Psalm 35, 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad that favor who? Them, who's the them? They that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, what? Let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. That word prosperity is translated, not rich money, it's shalom. It's the word for peace. Even though Saul and his followers turned many of the nation of Israel against David, the persecuted champion knew many others were there that saw through Saul's jealousy, and they stood behind David. It was kind of like a 50-50 thing with the nation of Israel. Half the people were for him, and half the people were with Saul, against him. So as David concludes to Psalm 35, his petition of prayer, his impeccator, his prayer, again, for God to, to take care of them, he thought not only of himself, but his supporters, those who were with him, and maybe even silently with him, that were afraid to cry out against Saul for fear that they would be killed, but they were with him. And David concludes his petition, again, of his loyal supporters. He prayed God would give them a reason. Let them shout for joy, he says, and be glad. David prayed their rejoicing would flow from a pure heart, not, again, not to gloat, over Saul's defeat so much, but to shout for joy that he's been vindicated. He wanted them to magnify, exalt, lift up the Lord for granting peace, that prosperity is the word shalom, for his faithful servant. And secondly and last, bear strong witness to God's righteousness and praise him. How long? All the day long. <laughs> Look at verse 28 in the last one here. My tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. This is what will happen as a result of God's answer to his petition here. David pledged to join with all his supporters in testifying of God's faithfulness by what? Praising him continually. He promised to speak of the Lord's righteousness, which implies two things, that he's not going to rejoice in the fall of Saul, and he would not take credit for the victory. You know, a lot of times when God gives us the victory, the human nature is a tendency to say, thank you, Lord. Or thank the Lord, yeah. And then you say, well, Lord, you, we did this and we did that. No, God should have all the praise that rightly belongs to him. Amen? Two lessons from Psalm 35. First, we should have faith. God will always bring, be true to himself, his character, his righteousness, his holiness. And like David, when we believe God will be faithful, we can praise him in advance for victories and deliverances that haven't even yet come. Now, this doesn't mean that you'll never suffer, nor does it mean that evildoers will never prevail against us. God's own son, again, crucified, but in the end, Christ triumphant, right? God gave him a greater glory than he had known before. So we may suffer at the hands of others. We may even be slain as some were martyred for the gospel's sake. But the victory of evildoers against Christ and the gospel is not final. In eternity, God's justice will be served. And we will be exalted to reign with Christ forever. And they will be banished to an everlasting separation from God in hell. And then last, we must always glorify God Never take credit for the marvelous things that he and he, and he only can do. Never gloat, take pleasure when justice is served upon those against us. Rejoice instead in the fact that God is just 
and he acts according to his perfect righteousness, the reason why we had victory in the first place. Again, not because we deserved it and not that they deserved, even though they were against us, they do deserve what they got. We're not gloating over it like, ha ha, God's got you. I prayed and it happened. I don't think God would be happy in that. Listen to what Proverbs, I'm going to finish with this, for chapter 24, verse 17. Proverbs 24, 17 says, Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. You know, when, when the enemy stumbles and falls because of their unrighteous cause or their lies against us or you and me or, or for the cause of Christ, it can be an opportunity. God can use their failure as an opportunity for you to show the love of, of Christ to them. Again, uh, humanly speaking, if somebody did this, what they did to David, to us, we, we would want to <laughs> do worse than what David prayed to them because of our heart, or our human nature, and our flesh. But we shouldn't let that happen. God, you take care of it. We cry out to God. When he does, we don't gloat. Rather, we can take advantage of an opportunity maybe to witness to these people, to let them know we hadn't done anything wrong and uh, that they need to be saved, and God can use it. God uses things like that to, to uh, reach people's hearts in ways that we could never do. And so allow God to work. I know about you, I have, and I talk about this all the time, we get impatient, and David here was crying out to God, act, and wake up, and, and hear me, and see what's happening, and, and he wanted it to happen yesterday. Of course, God doesn't work that way, especially from pressure from us. Right? And so we need to be patient. Tribulation brings patience, the Bible says. <laughs> I almost don't want to confess that I'm an impatient person because who wants tribulation? But you know what? God knows what I need. He knows what you need. He knows our besetting sins, and he does all he can to help us and to become more like Christ. And so that's my prayer for myself. Let's go to prayer, and uh, we got done a little early, believe it or not. When I was looking at this psalm, I saw oh, all these verses. I'm going to try to... Forget about squeezing it into one message, but sometimes I have a problem <laughs> squeezing it into two, but we did, thank the Lord. But let's pray, and I hope the Lord spoke to your heart like he spoke to mine. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these psalms we've been going through. I know we have 150, we're only on 35, but so much ahead of us. Uh, Lord, the more we look into your word, the more we know about you and your heart. And uh, again, we see the heart of David. You said, a man after your own heart. And Lord, he was human like we are. He was subject to passions like passions. So was Jesus, but Jesus didn't sin. David did. We do. We're forgiven because of what Jesus did, Lord. And we, in times when we're accused of things that are not true, like in this case here, David was not guilty of anything in this case. And he brought his petitions, his heart. Lord, it felt like he was dying. He was, again, they were seeking to kill him. So it was a real thing. It wasn't something just conjecture or made up. And Lord, uh, he cried out to you, help us to come to you, Lord, with these things and, and these needs and, again, slanders and accusations falsely against us, Lord. And again, when the victory comes, it may not be in this life, it may be in an eternity that we'll see the victory. But Lord, uh, help us to give you the glory for everything that you do in our lives. We know, Lord, that you want us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And you said the gates of hell. We have a promise that it would not prevail against the church or the ministry you've given us to preach the gospel. And so help us, Lord, give us the freedoms. Help us to go out when we have opportunity to do so. Lord, when this pandemic especially is uh, taken and we're able to freely walk and talk unmasked and, and able to, to touch and shake hands with people and greet people and get close to people, Lord, we pray that this would happen soon. We know you're not willing that any should perish, Father, and we ask you to, to, to remove this as an obstacle to evangelizing. And then when people trust Christ, that they'd be able to come and be a part of a church, a body of Christ locally here that would train them, disciple them, mature them, and see them reach spiritual growth and maturity to be able to go out and teach others and do the same thing. Lord, help us. Help us as we leave here tonight. Keep us safe. Uh, Lord, bring us back again together on Wednesday. And Lord, thank you for the season of the year when we think about what you did for us on the cross. Help us to be in our minds all the time and thinking of others. Now, may you be glorified in everything that's said and done this week as we leave. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.